Hello and welcome. This is Cambridge O Level Chemistry Paper 2. This is May June 2023 exam. The subject code is 5070 and this is version 1 of this exam. So before we start, I again request you to subscribe my channel. So let's start. My first question, it says choose from the following oxides to answer the questions. Each oxide may be used once, more than once, or not at all. Okay, so these are these. This is the list of the oxides we have. We have Al2O3 or aluminum oxide, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, calcium oxide, ferrous oxide, H2O, water, sodium hydroxide. So sorry, sodium oxide, sulfur dioxide, and silicon dioxide. So first part, it says state which oxide is a solid made during thermal decomposition of limestone. Limestone is CaCO3 thermal decomposition. It means that uh, it would be something that includes calcium and the only oxide of calcium is CaO. CaO is the answer. Next, next we have, it says reacts with both acids and alkalis. So we are, what we are looking here is an oxide that is amphoteric in nature. So Aluminium, zinc are the amphoteric oxides. So aluminium oxide is the one we are looking for. So Al2O3. Then it says, uh, number three, it says has a giant covalent structure. So out of these oxides, silicon dioxide is a, is a is or uh, is an oxide that has a giant silicon structure uh, or a giant structure that resembles somewhat uh, to uh, diamond, you can say. So silicon dioxide, SiO2, is something uh, or is the one we, we are looking for. Then it says it has an ion with an oxidation of plus 2. So ion with an oxidation of plus 2, uh, there is a calcium oxide uh, and there is a silicon. Uh, yeah, so there is a calcium oxide. So calcium oxide, CaO, uh, so no, with the Ca is 2 positive. O is to negative, so both are cancelling out each other, and that is the reason it is. Then it says uh, turns a white anhydrous copper sulfate blue. So and it is anhydrous copper sulfate when it is put in water, uh, the copper sulfate or the blue uh, color of the co copper sulfate solution comes. So it is water or H two. Then it says uh, is made during the fermentation of glucose. To make ethanol. So during this process, carbon dioxide is released. So CO2 or carbon dioxide oxide is there. So this is the um, answer for this question. So moving ahead, uh, question number two, it says group one includes elements like lithium, sodium, potassium, state physical properties of lithium. So lithium, uh, it is a soft material. Um, it has uh, low density. Other properties you can include low melting point. Uh, good thermal conductor. Thermal conductor. Or um, you can call, it is also a ductile material. It is malleable. Um, it is you can also call it as shiny. So these are all the uh, properties of uh, metals such as uh, lithium, sodium, potassium. Then part B says potassium reacts with cold water. The ionic equation for the reaction is shown. So two K plus H two O two K positive minus two O H negative plus H two. It's a part one says state the terms of electrons. Why potassium is a reducing agent in the reaction? So for potassium, see what is happening. So potassium, it is 2K uh, and then it is changing, changing to 2K positive. So it is basically reduce, uh, losing electrons and becoming this. Okay. Uh, so 2K is there. So it loses two electrons. So uh, becomes two times. Eh? So basically, uh, what happens is potassium loses electron, loses an electron, 
to become K positive loss of electrons is reduction. Okay, and that is why potassium is a reducing agent. <clears throat> Moving ahead, it says the oxidation number of hydrogen H2 is, so H2 is in a gaseous form, or any gas form is, the oxidation number is zero. H2 is zero, or, or you can write as zero. Okay, both will be fine. <clears throat> then it says, describe what is observed during this reaction. So observation would be uh, that uh, H2 gas or the effervescence of H2 gas is there. There will be some heat produced. Uh, so when we add potassium to hydrogen, uh, there is uh, a, a little flame can be seen or it, and the color is lilac, something like lilac color. Uh, and it dissolves in water and a colorless solution that is there. So observation, first of all, uh, effervescence of H2 gas is observed. Um, the reaction produces heat, a flame of lilac color is seen over the water because this is a very exothermic reaction. <clears throat> and uh, solid potassium dissolves in water to form a colorless solution. Okay, so this is how we, how we will write this answer. Then part C, it says a sample of sodium chloride is tested using a flame. State the color of the flame seen in the test. So remember sodium salt, when we burn it, it uh, emits a yellowish uh, orange sort of light. So uh, yellow flame, you can write it as yellow flame or orange flame. Any one of them will be uh, Good answer. Okay, moving ahead. But question number three. It says the question is about preparation of salts. Okay, so we are going to prepare a salt, and they we have given us uh, a part. It says zinc chloride is a soluble salt. It is prepared by reaction of an insoluble base with dilute acid. The equation for this reaction is zinc oxide two times HCl. Again, in aqueous form, gives us zinc chloride aqueous form and <clears throat> H2. Say so the sample of 3.5 grams of zinc oxide is added to 50 centimeter cube of 1.2 moles per dm cube hydrochloric acid. Show by calculation that zinc oxide is in excess. So first of all, let's find uh, or the uh, MR molecular mass of zinc is 65. For oxygen, it is 16. Okay, so MR of Said in oh, zinc oxide is 65 plus 16, it is 81. So, first of all, we calculate number of moles of Zn. in. So, zinc oxide, number of moles, 3.5 divided by MR. This is equal to 0 0.0432 moles. Okay. Uh, then, Calculate number of moles of HCl that are used. HCl, the number of moles of HCl, uh, we get 1.2 mole per thousand centimeter cube multiplied by 50. Remember, one dm cube is equal to 1000 centimeter cube. 50 centimeter cube. Uh, so what we get is this zero. 0 0.06 moles of HCl are used. Okay. So in the reaction, what we see, we see that two moles of HCl 
requires one mole of ZMO. So if we have one mole of HCl, it will require one by two moles of zinc oxide. If we have 0 0.06 moles of HCl, it will require one by two multiplied by 0 0.06 moles of ZNO and this comes out to be 0 0.03 moles are required. So this reaction needs a 0 0.03 moles. So excess ZNO, excess ZNO will be a 0 0.0432 minus 0 0.03. So the excess will be 0.0132 moles of ZNO and this is approximately 1.0692 grams of ZNO is excess. Okay, so this is how you calculate uh, the excess amount of ZNO that's present in the reaction. Okay, moving ahead. Part two, it says state why the it is important to use excess zinc oxide in the preparation. Well, so if uh, so excess zinc oxide, uh, why we use it to consume all the acid that is required because we can easily filter out zinc oxide uh, and we'll get a concentrated solution of zinc chloride without any acid. Okay, and now we're just simply in water. So, so it's equal to ensure that no acid remains in, in the solution okay so that may no acid remain in the solution and is completely used up okay then it says suggest how zinc oxide can be removed from reaction mixture to leave only aqueous zinc chloride we filter filtration filtration <clears throat> of the liquid as that you know is insoluble okay you can just simply Filter filtration of the liquid, uh, or you can or um, use using filter paper. Okay, so filtration of the liquid using filter paper can give us. Then it says barium sulfate is an insoluble salt. It is prepared using precipitation reaction. <clears throat> so barium sulfate, we are making a precipitate. Name two aqueous solution that react together. So to give barium sulfate. So barium sulfate, remember, is barium sulfate is uh, written like this. So we need a barium salt and that salt should be a soluble salt. So soluble salt will be all nitrates are soluble. Remember barium nitrate. Uh, we, all nitrates are soluble. Okay, so we need barium nitrate then reacted with an acid that contains uh, SO4 or sulfate ion. So that will be sulfuric acid. So this will give us barium sulfate. Okay. And then all the byproducts. So what we can have is uh, <clears throat> we have uh, aqua solution that react together. It would be barium nitrate, barium nitrate and sulfuric acid. Okay, so these are or these will be the solutions that I need to make a precipitate of barium sulfate. Then, question part C it says sodium nitrate again, it's a soluble salt, it is prepared by the reaction between an acid and an alkali. So, acid and a base reaction. So, name uh, so it is NaNO3. So, I mean, that is fine. So, NaNO3 is there. So uh, acid and a base, uh, so an alkali, uh, so alkali will be sodium hydroxide and acid must have NO3, H, so it would be HNO3. So acid will be nitric acid, 
nitric acid. Uh, it is HNO3. And on the alkali side is sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide. This is NaOH. Uh, then it says name the experimental technique used to make neutral aqueous sodium nitrate. So the experimental technique is titration technique. Okay. So this is a titration technique. We can easily make in this in lab by using these two uh, materials or these two sorry solutions uh, by using the titration method. Okay. So moving ahead, question number four. It says this question is about compounds that contain phosphorus. Part A. The formula of a phosphide ion can be written as uh, P minus uh, P three minus thirty one fifteen. So the complete the table show number of particles uh, in the phosphide ion. So remember, 15 is the atomic number. Okay. And this is the mass number. Okay. So atomic number is equal to number of protons and also equal to number of electrons in an element. Okay, the number of protons will be equal to 15. So 15 will be the number of protons. The number of electrons will again will be equal to 15. But remember, we have a 3 minus. So it means that it has gained 3 more electrons. So it will be 18. So number of electrons will be 18. And then we have a mass number of 31. And if we subtract 15 protons from it, we will be getting 16. This is the Num total number of neutrons that are present in the uh, phosphide ion. So this is how we write it. Then it says state why formula of phosphide ion P3 negative rather than 2 negative or <clears throat> 4 negative. So remember uh, phosphide is uh, atomic number is 15. So 15 means that there are 2 electrons in the first shell, 8 in the next and 5 electrons in the <clears throat> other shell in the outermost shell. So it can do two things. It can lose five electrons or it can gain three electrons to become stable. So it can, it will become, it will lose five electrons. It will be, the outer shell will have eight. It will get, gain three more electrons. The outer shell will have eight number of electrons and the octet is complete. So to have a stable phosphide ion, the phosphide, uh, we need to have an octet uh, or we need to have the complete stable outer shell and that is uh, why we and the easy or uh, low energy or the easiest uh, method to achieve this stability is by gaining three electrons. So first chorus gains three electrons to complete its outer shell octet to become a stable line. <clears throat> okay, this is what uh, that is required from you in this answer. So minus P minus 2 or P minus 4 won't be stable lines for the uh, phosphate. <laughs> Moving ahead, part C, it says formula of calcium ion is Ca2 positive. Deduce the formula of calcium phosphide. So remember phosphide was 3 negative. The formula is C3 negative, P2 negative. <clears throat> okay. Then it says calcium phosphate. Ca3PO4 2 is an ionic compound. Explain why calcium phosphide has a high melting point. So it's an ionic compound. Um, so high melting point is associated with strong electrostatic forces of attraction between the ions as well as a large structure. So calcium phosphate has a large structure. 
the last structure, it also has strong electrostatic attraction between the ions. Okay. And these this is the two reasons for the for a compound or for an ionic compound or having a high uh, melting point. Okay. So moving ahead, it says calculate the percentage by mass of phosphorus in calcium phosphate. So calcium phosphate Ca3 PO4 2. First of all, calculate MR. MR is equal to <clears throat> 3 multiply uh, uh, for calcium 40 multiply by 3 plus 2 multiply by <clears throat> phosphorus is 31 plus oxygen is 16. There are 4. So this is how the mass comes. So that will be 310. So percentage of phosphorus, this will be 2 times 31 divided by 310 multiply by 100 and this comes out to be 20%. So 20% of this compound is phosphorus percentage in mass 20%. Okay, so this is how you solve this question. Moving ahead, <clears throat> next question, question number 15. Oh, sorry, question number five. Uh, it says ammonium, chlor uh, ammonium chloride decomposes when heated, when heated to make hydrogen chloride and ammonium. This reaction is reversible. The forward reaction absorbs thermal energy. Uh, so we have ammonium chloride again, solid form. And when we heat it, uh, it's here, hyd uh, hydrochloric acid and ammonia gas is released. So again, the input is solid, uh, our output are gases. So then first A says equilibrium mixture is formed when the reversible reaction happens in a closed system. State what is meant by equilibrium. Include ideas that about rate of reaction and concentration of the reactants and products in your answer. <clears throat> so equilibrium for uh, reversible reaction is defined as a point where rate of forward reaction comes equal to the rate of backward reaction the concentration the concentration of products and reactants remains constant instead at this point. Okay, this is how you define this. Next part, part two says predict what happens to the position of equilibrium. When the temperature is increased and the pressure remains constant. So remember, you have NH4Cl, which is solid. That goes something like this. HCl plus ammonia gas, NH3. Okay. So if I... <clears throat> and this reaction absorbs thermal energy. So if, if this reaction absorbs thermal energy, it means that this is endothermic reaction. 
So remember, this is an endothermic reaction. And what we are doing, we are increasing the temperature. So if we are increasing the temperature, the reaction will actually move in a direction to compensate that. Okay. So what will happen? So it's an endothermic reaction. So forward reaction uh, is actually endothermic. Increasing temperature is basically supporting the backward reaction. So you are increasing the backward reaction by increasing the temperature. What exactly will happen? So the, the system will oppose the uh, increase in temperature. So the oppose and increase in temperature will be done by, uh, by the increase in forward reaction. So that is what will happen. So forward reaction will increase. This is one. Then, so increase a uh, increase in temperature favors backward reaction the system will move in a direction to compensate this. Okay, so the increasing temperature, so the temperature is increased, the reaction that generates and uh, that is actually the end endothermic process will help to compensate this. <clears throat> Then it says predict what happened. Oh, importantly, this is actually the questions of Lee Chatelier's Chatelier's principle. This question comes from the understanding of the Lee Chatelier's principle. And if you are going to revise, <clears throat> you have to revise that Lee Chatelier's principles topic in your from your chemistry book to answer these questions. Then part three. It says predict what happens to the position of equilibrium when pressure is increased and the temperature remains constant. So for this case, remember we have for pressure, we have number of moles. So there are zero moles here of gas. And there is one and one, two moles of gas over. <clears throat> okay, so we have two moles of gas and we have zero moles of gas. So if the pressure is increased, so the, when the pressure is increased, what will happen? The pressure will increase. Uh, the forward reaction will start to increase. And what the system will do, so, or basically increasing pressure uh, moves the reaction from less number of moles to high number of moles. So the so system basically compensates this. So since it has to reach an equilibrium, so compensate this, the system must go from a case where they from higher number of moles to lower number of moles to compensate the pressure. This is why. So from high number of moles, it's to low number of moles. So from two to one, so that is the backward reaction. So in this case, the backward reaction, reaction will increase, okay? <clears throat> so the backward equilibrium increase. So explanation: uh, the equilibrium will shift in a way to compensate the increase in pressure okay the direction of the uh, we can say the direction of the reaction 
will be from higher number of moles of gas is to lower number of moles. Okay, and since uh, the backward reaction, so we have two moles on this side, we have two moles here, if we move in this direction, we'll have zero moles of gas, and that is how we compensate for the increase in pressure. <clears throat> so part B says, predict what happens to the rate of backward reaction when temperature is increased and pressure remains constant. So this is the same part that what we have answered here. So what happens if temperature is increased? So temperature is when temperature is increased, actually the backward reaction increases okay and the system increases the forward reaction to compensate it so the backward reaction the, the backward reaction increases okay to so increase in temperature why it has increased so increase in temperature increases the average kinetic energy of the molecules resulting in more effective collisions for reaction to take place. Okay. So moving ahead, uh, it's part C. It says predict what happens to the backward reaction when the pressure is increased. <clears throat> so backward reaction, again, when the pressure is increased, the backward reaction increases. Uh, Okay, because the system is actually trying to compensate the increase in pressure. So increase in pressure. So in pressure results in more number of gas molecules. Per unit area, thereby increasing the probability of successful slash effective collisions collisions for the reaction to take place. Okay, so this is how <clears throat> we write this answer. So moving ahead, <clears throat> question number six, it says, the question is about energy <clears throat> changes that take place during chemical reaction. So methane reacts with chlorine to make chloromethane. The reaction is again, this is important, exothermic. <clears throat> so heat is released to the surrounding. So it means that the reactants will have more energy and whereas products will have less energy. And that is the reason why the remaining energy goes into the surrounding. So draw a labeled axis diagram, provide the reaction pathway and include the label axis, reactants, products, enthalpy, activation energy. So initially we have some reactants. Oh, before that, so let's label it. So label is it, energy is given here. And this is reaction pathway. 
okay so and the products will have some low energy okay so initially uh, the reaction will take place something like this the reaction pathway will look something like this okay okay So this is the activation energy or EA, call it activation energy. This distance is delta H or enthalpy of the system. Okay. And the here we have the products and here we have the reactors. And this is the energy or pathway diagram for exothermic reaction okay and for for endothermic reaction <clears throat> this whole thing shifts the products will have more energy reactions will have less energy and the diagram will look in uh, or for endothermic reaction this will look something like this the diagram so the products this is your activation energy this is your delta h and this is your reactants. This is your products. And this heat is gained, absorbed from the surroundings to <clears throat> decrease the temperatures. This is how an endothermic process will uh, reaction will look like. Okay. So moving ahead, part B it says hydrogen de hydrogen iodide decomposes. To make <clears throat> hydrogen, hydrogen and iodine interpret the enthalpy change of this reaction. Okay, so first of all, bond formation energy, and we have to calculate <clears throat> bond breaking energy. Okay, so bond formation <clears throat> we have um, H H. That is 436 kilojoules per mole. And we have HI, oh sorry, II, that is 151 kilojoules per mole. So the effective energy <clears throat> is uh, 590, 596 kilojoules per mole. And this is uh, actually uh, the product okay the product side on the bond breaking side we have h i the energy is 298 and there are two bonds of uh, it so uh, h i will be 2 into 298 and this will come up to be 596 kilojoules per mole oh sorry if we add this this is equal to uh, 587 kilojoules. Okay, and this is my reactants, this part. Okay, and the ch change in enthalpy, delta H, is actually what we have seen here. We have reactants minus products. So, reactants minus products. So energy of reactants is 596 kJ per mole minus product 587 kilojoules per mole. So it comes out to be 9 kilojoules per mole. And this energy is released to the surrounding, and that is why this reaction is exothermic. So 9 kilojoules per mole will be my answer. Okay. So moving on, next question, question number seven. It says methanol, propen one all, propen two all are alcohols. The displayed name for methanol and propen one all is shown. State the general formula for the homologous series of alcohols. So remember, alcohols are Cn, H2n plus one, <clears throat> OH. This is the general homologous series formula of alcohols. Remember, do not add this H to this H. That will, is not the <clears throat> desired condition or the, the desired formula for alcohol. Part B says, 
Proton 1 all and Proton 2 all have same molecular formula but different structural formula. So they are actually isomers. Then part 2 state the name given to these compounds that have same molecular formula but different structural formula are ah, isomers. <clears throat> okay. Then it says structural formula of Proton 2 all. So remember uh, Proton 1 all. Proton 1 all it means that the first car carbon atom is attached with the OH bond. Then second, one, two, and then three. One, two, three, one, two. So with propan, with propan, two all, the OH will go, this will go with the second carbon atom, CH3. We have C, this becomes OH, this is H, this is this formula will look something like this. <clears throat> okay, so this is one, this is two, this is three, so this is proper two. You don't have to write one, two, three, just write this up will be sufficient for complete credit. This is your answer that will give you a complete credit for this. Moving ahead, it says state why propan one all is a saturated compound. Means that there is uh, it only contains single bond. There is no double bond, triple bond that can. So it only contains single bond between its. Constituent carbon atoms. Okay. And say state why propan one all is not a hydrocarbon. A hydrocarbon only contains carbon and hydrogen, it contains oxygen. It contains oxygen. The hydrocarbons. Only contain carbon and hydrogen. Okay. Then, oh, sorry. Uh, then part E. It says propyl one all reacts the same way as ethanol. Yes, it's a same thing. Propyl all, propyl one all. Draw this. Draw the displayed formula of the product of the reaction of propan one all with acidified aqueous potassium manganate. So propan one all this basically makes propanic acid. Uh, C C C propan all. Let me draw. So this is propan all plus K N N four acidified. We are basically using it up, so it becomes C C C O H H H H H H, and here we become this. This is actually your propanic acid or C two H. Five C O H. Okay, so this is how you solve this. Or make this. Up. You can always write H here, and that is a good practice to write all the. Okay, so this is the output or the formula for the product of the reaction. Then it says it draw displayed formula for the product of reaction of propan one all with ethanic acid. So again, now you have made a propanic acid. Well, if you have an ethanic acid, something in the same scheme, and you react it with propanol, what will you get? You will get an ester. So acid plus an alcohol or for a carboxylic acid with a carbo with an alcohol will give you an ester. So what you have, you have C123. C12, C12, OH with ethanic acid. Uh, this is C12, 
C1,2COOH. This is your ethanoc acid. Okay, in presence of a catalyst, it gives you and an ester plus water. Okay, so the ester will look like uh, so you have first this will come C123, C double bond O, H here, H here, H here. Then remove the OH, remove the H, and flip this whole thing and take it from here. O, then comes C, C, three times C, H, 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 and H. So this is to will look something <clears throat> like this. So this is the Answer. The name of this acid acid uh, will be uh, propanic, so pro, uh, propanol, so propyl, propyl and ethanic acid acetate, <clears throat> propyl acetate. So propyl acetate. This is your okay. This is how you write this. So next part, it says methane is a <clears throat> covalent, uh, methanol is a covalent substance. So methanol again uh, is C, uh, uh, H3, methanol, OH. This is methanol, C3OH <clears throat> is methanol. So methanol is a covalent substrate, it says draw, Dot and cross diagram to show the bonding of the molecule of methanol. Okay, include outer shell electrons. So remember, we are representing C by a dot, H by a cross, and oxygen by a triangle. Okay, that is the key here. So first of all, we have C, and C is connected or is attached to three hydrogen atoms. So first hydrogen atom, so this is, it makes a covalent bond. So there will be an overlap. This is H and this is H. Dot for H or dot for C cross for H, dot for C cross for H, dot for C cross. So now, so we have two, four, six and eight. So this is six here. Then we have <clears throat> bonding with O. Oxygen molecule, oxygen molecule will be having uh, one electron and dot. So this is the complete octet for C. All the hydrogens are stable with it. Oxygen, oxygen two here, two here, two here, two here, and then another H is connected with the oxygen here. This is triangle and a cross. Okay, so this is a complete molecule of oxygen. Let me draw this O in the middle. Okay, so this is how the complete molecule of methane or methanol will look like. Okay, so moving ahead, it says why methanol does not conduct electricity. So it's all uh, the electrons. So if we see the structure, it says all the electrons. Are covalently bonded together. There are no free electrons available for the Conduction of electric city. Okay. <clears throat> then part G, it says methanol is used as a solvent. State what is meant by the term solvent. Solvent is a chemical that can dissolve other substances such as solutes. Uh, solvent is <clears throat> a chemical 
substance used <clears throat> to dissolve <clears throat> other substances or spark acid or lutes. Uh, it is also going also call it as a liquid that can dissolve a solute a liquid that so one way to write is this other way is liquid that can dissolve a solute okay so moving ahead question number eight so question number eight it says <clears throat> that this question is about electrolysis the table shows some information about electrolysis of three different electrolytes using graphite electrodes. Complete table 8.1 with names of the electrodes. So we have aqueous potassium chloride, aqueous copper sulfate, molten lead iodide. Let's try to draw this here. Okay. This is, for example, um, our chamber. We have these two graphite electrodes. Okay, so we have two graphite electrodes, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus is here, minus is here. So we have this as anode, <clears throat> we have this as cathode. Okay, so first case, uh, we have uh, dilute potassium chloride. K C L and it is aqueous or dilute. So the number of the ions we have, we have K positive, C L negative, H positive, O H negative. So the, in this case, <clears throat> O H negative ions will move to anode and H positive will move to cathode. So what we will get, we'll get uh, <clears throat> uh, at anode. Oxygen gas, oxygen gas, and at cathode, we'll get hydrogen gas. <clears throat> Similarly, we have aqueous copper sulfate, copper sulfate, and that is again aqueous form. So <clears throat> we have copper ions, <clears throat> we have sulfate ions, we have water. So these two ions will move to negative electrode, these two will positive. So, so on the positive side, we'll again get oxygen gas. Oxygen gas is released on the cathode or on the negative electrode between copper and hydrogen. Copper is low in the electronegativity series. So the copper will be deposited. So we'll be getting copper as a product over there. <clears throat> then we have molten lead iodide okay so we have only two lead two positive ions and we have iodide ions so what we'll be getting on the anode we will be getting iodine we'll be getting iodine and on the cathode we'll be getting lead deposited so this is how or what will be our products for this case then part b says the electrolysis of copper sulfate gives different products when copper electrodes are used instead of <clears throat> graphite electrodes. So describe the observations electrolysis in copper. So in this case, the positive electrode anode dissolves so and gets deposited on the uh, negative electrode, which is actually copper. And overall, the, <clears throat> the, uh, the copper sulfate concentration remains the same, or you can say that the the uh, solution, which is copper sulfate, is a blue solution and it stays blue. So, the uh, thing is, the anode dissolves and gets deposited on the cathode. the electrolyte solution stays blue or the color does not change. 
Okay, these are the two observations which we get in this case. Okay. Then um, part C, it says magnesium is manufactured by electrolysis of molten magnesium chloride. Okay, at anode, chloride ions react to make chlorine molecules, construct half ionic equation. So chloride ions uh, at anode, chloride ions forms chlorine gas. Okay, so chloride ion will get well, it's a negative ion, it, gain, it loses electrons here. Uh, and this is aqueous. So this is how this equation will look like. Or you can also write 2Cl negative, Cl2 plus 2 electrons negative. Okay. So these are two ways of writing this equation. And both will give you any one of them you can write, you will be getting complete credit. Okay, so moving ahead, question number nine, it says oxides of nitrogen, such as nitrogen monoxide, NO, are, amphot at, are atmospheric pollutants. Okay, the exhaust gas of a car engine contains 0.002% by volume of nitrogen monoxide. Calculate the number of molecules of nitrogen monoxide in 960 decimeter cube of exhaust gas for at room temperature and pressure. One mole of any gas contains 6.02 into 10 power 23 part molecules. Remember this, the question is uh, for the, this lab, PV equals to NRT or the gas law that is used. So, and uh, at one thing we need to remember at room temperature, and pressure, one mole of any gas is 24 decimeter cube of volume. Okay, this is something we need to remember. One mole of any gas at room temperature and pressure is approximately 24 decimeter cubes in volume. Okay, so first of all, we calculate volume of NO in exhaust gas. This is 0 0.002 divided by 100 multiplied by 960 decimeter cube. This is actually equal to 0 0.0192 decimeter cube. So this is the volume. So, in volume of gas, so number of moles, number of moles of nitrogen at room temperature and pressure. So, if we have 24 dm cube, we have one mole. If we have 0 0.0192 dm cube, we will have this divided by 24 dm cube. This is equal to uh, 8 into 10 to power minus 4 moles of NO or nitrogen, uh, nitrogen monoxide gas. So number of molecules is equal to 8 4 minus 8 and 10 power minus 4 moles multiplied by Avogadro number or 0 0.02 6.02 10 to power 23 molecules and this comes out to be 4.816 into 10 to power 20 molecules. Okay, so this is the number of molecules 4.816 into 10 to power 20 will be your answer. So moving ahead, part B it says nitrogen and oxygen react to make nitrogen monoxide inside a car engine can start an equation for this. So nitrogen plus oxygen or incomplete combustion gives you nitrogen monoxide. That is uh, how this equation can be written. Let's just state one adverse effect of oxides of nitrogen as pollutants. So it is cause causes acid rain. Acid rain also causes respiration. 
respiratory problems. So it's bad for breathing. Especially damages the lung. Then it says describe how oxides of nitrogen form inside a car or removed by a catalytic converter. So catalytic converter basically uh, converts these nitrogen oxides uh, to nitrogen gas, uh, which is a big constituent of the atmosphere. With, and this is done with the help of carbon monoxide. So uh, the catalytic converter reacts the nitrogen oxides with carbon monoxide to form nitrogen gas that is N2 okay and so N2 is this N2 one released in the atmosphere itself, then that is the E component of the atmosphere itself. So moving ahead, it says uh, E part, it says the rate of diffusion of nitrogen dioxide is less than that of nitrogen monoxide under the same conditions of temperature and pressure. Explain why the rate of diffusion of nitrogen dioxide is less than nitrogen oxide, nitrogen monoxide under the same. Nitrogen dioxide is heavier. Two is a heavier gas with uh, so nitrogen. Uh, it is nitrogen is fourteen plus oxygen sixteen plus sixteen thirty uh, and thirty two. Oh, sorry, uh, thirty, forty, forty six. Yes, uh, with six compared to an O gas with MR of thirty, the heavier gases diffuse. Slowly compared to the lighter gases. Okay. So moving ahead. So moving ahead, we have Moving ahead, we have uh, part two. It says the rate of diffusion of nitrogen monoxide decreases as temperature decreases. Suggest so why using kinetic uh, th particle uh, th uh, theory to explain this. Okay, so the decrease in temperature, uh, the decrease in temperature. decreases the average kinetic energy of the molecules of an O gas this results in slowing down the movement, slowing down the rate of diffusion of the gas, right? rate of diffusion of an O gas. Okay. So this is how you answer this question. 
So moving ahead, question number 10, which is the last question of this exam. Uh, it says, uh, PVC and polypropene are polymers made by reaction called addition polymerization. Okay. It says, draw the structure of monomer used to make PVC. So polyvinyl chloride, that is the PVC we have. So if we see that this is the repeating structure, so first of all, just simply draw this C, C, this is Cl, this is H, this is H, this is H, and make a double bond here. This is simply the monomer for the PVC. Okay. This is the monomer used for the manufacturing of PVC. Moving at says polypropene. A uh, polypropene is a polymer used to make plastic food containers. The diagram shows the structure of polypropene. Uh, then part one, it says some waste polypropene plastic is decomposed, is disposed by burning. This make this makes a toxic gas because of incomplete combustion. Name the toxic gas. So remember this the only this is an hydrocarbon. So hydrocarbon complete combustion. Complete combustion results in carbon dioxide, which is not that toxic, but still it's there. But incomplete combustion results in carbon monoxide, and which is a toxic gas. So carbon monoxide gas or CO is the product. Then it says a uh, state one environmental challenge caused by disposable of waste polypropene plastic. Explain how this challenge is related to the prop uh, the uh, properties of polypropene. So it actually uh, environmental challenges fills up the land fill accumulates in oceans. Okay. So explanation, so the material is chemically inert, inert and insoluble in water. It takes a lot of time to decompose naturally. So in some cases, plastics may take up to 500 years to decompose. So that is why it's very uh, environmentally uh, disastrous material, I would say. So moving ahead, uh, it says part C on the last part of this exam, uh, it says name one condition polymer. So a condition polymer, uh, nylon, polyamide, polyesters, PET, all are condition polymers. So nylon, uh, that bottles which are used, polyamides, then polyesters, all are these, these all are condensation polymers. So the linkages, so there are, remember, there are two linkages. One is the amide linkage. For example, in polyamide, we'll have amide linkage. And then we have a ester link H. Okay. Okay. So depending on the polymers, you can always... Uh, Use. So, for example, if you're using polyester, you can draw the ester linkage, which is C double bond O that O. And if you're using nylon, that uses amide linkage. So, amide linkage is N B double bond O C dash H. And so, this is an amide linkage or polyamide. So, if you are naming polyamide, poly, uh, polyesters, then draw the amide linkage. If you're using the polyesters, draw the ester linkage. So, it's up to you, whatever you write make sure that you write the associated linkage 
of that polymer. Polyamide, nylons, leucemide linkage, polyesters, PET, uh, use uh, ester linkage. So this is uh, this uh, exam. I hope you have understood uh, something out of it. And uh, I will again request you to subscribe the channel and share the link with your friends and uh, wish you all the best for your exam preparations and your future objectives. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Take care.